Do you have a yearning for building science? Then you have come to the right place. Earlier this year, I was asked to give a Building Science 101 presentation at the annual Retrofoam Conference. And we actually recorded that presentation just for you. In this presentation, I do cover, again, building science basics, heat flow, how it works, different types of heat flow, as well as airflow, how that works and how they play into your home comfort. Please, if you wanna learn more about this, yes, it is one of our longer videos, but there is a ton of information and a lot of analogies that can help you understand how building science actually works inside your home. So check out this video of Building Science 101. If you've ever been around a campfire, you have experienced most forms of heat flow, one of which I hope you have not, and that is conduction. Okay, but let's talk about conduction for a second. Simplest way to explain it, physical touch. Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's say, uh, how many people, show of hands, grab some sky if you've ever cooked something in an oven? No? Matt, I'll show you how, it's not a big deal. Okay, so most of us have, right? When you take said item out of an oven, do you just reach in like a barbarian and grab it? Or instead, do you grab some type of mitten or some type of fancy silicone wizardry that was sold to you on the TV before you take it out. Probably most of us do, right? Why don't you? Because it's probably super hot, right? You don't wanna grab that pan, scream, make a big scene, it'd be super embarrassing, right? A little quick tidbit, you know what that pad, that glove, that mitten does? It insulates, who said it? Travis, my man insulates your hand from this hot surface. It's protecting you from conduction. Same thing if you have to move wood around in the fire, you're not just gonna stick your hands in there. I mean, depending on how many of, uh, you know, Shane's martinis you may have had, you're not just gonna reach in and start moving stuff around. Same thing, it's a little hot. That's conduction. Physical touch, simplest way to think about that, right? The next thing, let's talk about uh, convection. Air movement. You can, like, super scientific, say, well, it's vapor traveling through the air. Okay, sure. Most of us would say air, convection, air. Super simple way to think about heat transfer based on convection. How many people in this room, again, grab some sky, and by now you should know, I might call you out. How many people have ever used a fan, a box fan, oscillating fan, something like that, right? What does that do? It moves air. Now we all know that a fan, especially like those electronic fans, I don't know the magic that is Dyson, it might actually like have a condenser in it or something, but those fans, they don't make air cooler, all they do is move air, and that movement of air, you know, it's accelerated, that movement of air across the surface, if it's your body or a room, carries heat with it. It transfers air, moves heat by way of convection. So convection, simplest way to think about it is air movement. You can think about a fan, again, not making the air cooler, simply making the air move. By making air move, you force that air to carry heat away from things and in and out of rooms. Maybe you put fans in the windows, right? During a hotter season, you know, trying to get that hot air out during the day, get some in at night, right? You're just moving air, convection. Now, let's talk about radiation. And I'm not talking about like the fun kind of radiation that like Godzilla, and the Hulk come from. But let's talk about that campfire again. Why do we sit around the campfire? Let's say it's colder outside, why would you build a fire? Heat, right? Because that fire is a little warm. Now you're sitting by the fire, right? Typically you're outside, so you're not putting a fan or some type of blower that's forcing that heat towards you, right? You're just sitting by the fire. And sitting close to that fire, the closer you sit, the warmer it is. You gotta sit like 10, 15 feet away from the fire because it's too hot, right? All, that's radiation. Simply by getting close to something, being in close proximity, heat radiates in waves. And, uh, and you feel that the closer you get to it, obviously the further away. That's the easiest comparison that I found with a homeowner. I'm sure there's a dozen more and don't worry, be, keep, uh, keep your thinking caps on because I'm gonna ask for some more examples later. But these are just some examples that I've found with homeowners to explain. And as you can see, it's pretty simple, right? Most everyone has sat around a campfire. Most everyone has used a fan of some sort, right? So you can get these concepts. Now again, 
be thinking because I want some examples later. Because if you may have had this conversation in a house and maybe you use something different. I have been in a house before and used all these examples with a hot cup of coffee. And you can see all these forms of uh, heat flow during this uh, while holding this cup of coffee. Obviously, if it's a really hot mug, you grab the handle, right? That's a little uh, industry secret. That's why coffee mugs have handles. Not everyone knows that. But if you grab the mug, a lot of times it's really hot, right? You might see steam coming off of that cup of uh, coffee right and depending on the cup itself or even the pot of coffee if you put your hand near you can feel some heat radiating off of it you get all these forms the point is this can be a really complicated process to explain or it can be super simple we talked about analogies yesterday right and being able to use these in the house with a homeowner, making these concepts that can be super complicated and things that no one cares about. But make no mistake, these are the tools in which we use to solve their problems. These are the tools we use to solve their problems. So, if you can explain things like this, explain why that wall might be hot and or cold, why drafts cause such a problem, that helps establish you as that expert. That other person that comes into the house trying to sell something, they most likely don't know. And if they do know this, a lot of people don't take the time to train themselves on how to explain these concepts. Again, this isn't rocket surgery up here, right? We're just trying to explain these things to homeowners because this is actually the science that we're trying to control. And that's all insulation is. Insulation is simply a barrier. That's what it means. Now we use a product like foam because it also stops air. So now we're talking about two things, conduction, convection. Does it help with radiation as well? Absolutely. But in the grand scheme of things, when we're talking about the house, not as important typically as conduction and convection. As we go through this, yes, climate zones, where you live, where you work will dictate how important one thing is over the other, 100%. But we're gonna keep talking about that. Conduction, convection, radiation. Simple terms, if you can explain it easily to your customer. Interesting tidbit about heat transfer. If you want to you know, be kind of nerdy and try to impress your homeowner, depending if they are impressible. Heat transfers nothing gets colder. So things lose their heat, they don't get colder. Nothing gains coldness, it loses its heat. When you put ice in a cup of water, that ice does not, I'm sorry, the water does not get colder, that ice gets warmer. Yes, the heat is transferring. This is something, again, kind of feel that out when you're talking to people, when we're talking about nothing actually getting colder, heat just transfers from one thing to another. And that's all we're doing is trying to control that, right? And this really bodes true whether you're trying to cool a house in a warmer climate, right? If you're trying to heat a house in a cooler climate, if where you work has cold and hot seasons, well, you, you kind of need everything, right? Heat flow, it can be as complicated as you want, but having some of these things in your back pocket to explain this concepts can definitely set you apart because most people don't take the time. Let's talk about air pressure for a second. Couple concepts about air pressure, fairly simple. Air pressure always wants to go from high to low and it always wants to get to neutral. Uh, we think about this, have we ever, again, show of hands, how many people while you're heating and or cooling your house, did you open one door or close another and on the way out the door, it slams behind you? Yeah, yeah experience it, right? It happens. Because you're changing the air pressure inside that room and inside your house. And as you create an opening, there's a flood and it's all rushing out. And that door gets caught in that flood and gets slammed shut. 
Now your spouse probably thinks you're angry about something, when really it's just, you know, it's science betraying you for a moment. Think about it for a second. How many people have ever in the summer, maybe, you know, as you were kids, or maybe yesterday, I don't know your life, have you ever filled up a water balloon and somehow magically there was one little pinhole somewhere in the water balloon, right? And as you were kids, you're like, oh, hi, it's peeing. Oh, was that just me? All right, okay. All right, Jerry, my man, all right. We're also children, my dog. Okay, but this is a prime example of how air pressure works, right? Same concept, again, you have a container. It's got some pressure in it. Now, the water balloon obviously has pressure because the container has expanded and it's trying to get back to its original state, right? That's the pressure. In our houses, we've added so much air and the walls, the container, again, it can't expand because we've built it to be uh, sound. So now that air is trying to get out somehow. Okay, so anyways, got your water balloon, got your pinhole, and now it's peeing that little stream of water, right? Same thing, your houses do the exact same thing. So, we've all probably heard the comparison somewhere uh, in, our, in our careers that uh, the average house has about, you know, we've heard a basketball size hole or a three by three window size uh, hole in the exterior walls. That's how much cumulative uh, openings, cracks and crevices that they have that's letting air in and out. Stack effect. I mentioned it a little bit ago. I want to talk about it. Now in this model it shows a winter and summer example. Now when we're talking about winter and summer, really we can equate that to hot and cold. So if you're talking about different climates, really that's, uh, that's all it is, right? Hot and cold. So when we're looking at this, stack effect in a cold climate or a winter climate, hot air rises because we're heating the inside of the building. That air is pressurized. It's going to rise quicker because heat rises quicker. As that's happening, that heat is going up and it's drawing air in from the bottom. Warm climates or in the summer does the exact opposite, right? As we know, if heat rises, cool air must fall. So if you were cooling that air, it's falling, right? And it's going to fall quicker the more you increase that air pressure. And as that air is falling, that air at the top is going to get replaced. It's going to start sucking air in. Boom. That's right. <laughs> so when we're talking about stack effect, here is the easiest example that I have been able to find thus far. Mushroom cloud, right? Everyone familiar with this image? Yeah, right? Okay. Now, mushroom cloud. This is something I was super proud the first time I used this example in a house because I realized this in eighth grade science uh, that this was happening. That shape happens because the heat is rising. As that heat rises, eventually some of it will cool because the heat at the bottom is getting, uh, the air at the bottom is getting heated so fast it's going to push out of the way the air above it that's slightly cooler. However, when that's happening, as it's going out, it's getting sucked back in because the air at the bottom is moving up so quickly, it gets vacuumed back in. This is a really, really exaggerated form of stack effect. That heat is rising and rising, and that air is rising so quickly because it's so hot, as it gets to the top and it's slightly cooler, then what's underneath it, it starts to get pushed out of the way, right? Well, that cycle is happening like that, and it gets pulled back in because of that force. You do the same thing in your house. If it's hot or cold, you can simply, sip a <laughs> simply flip it upside down. But you're doing the same thing. You're moving the air inside the house, and you are creating a vacuum. That's some cool science. Okay, so now the building standards I want to talk about on this is the new standard in a lot of ways is build it tight, ventilate right. We've all heard the adage, houses need to breathe. There's a lot that goes into this and I get it. This will be very controversial for some people, but hear me out. Now, the standard practice for most construction nowadays is going to be just that. Build it super tight, ventilate right. Make the shell as tight as possible. Rely on adequate HVAC 
to give the house the fresh air it needs, get the stale air out if that's needed. But you want your box, your shell, your building envelope, fancy terms, to be as tight as possible and trust your HVAC. This is a very new term and idea for a lot of people, especially builders. If you've had a conversation with the builder and you've probably heard, I've been building houses for 50 years. The guy's, you know, 40 years old and been building house for 50 years. I get it. It's new, but that is the new standard. Insulation versus HVAC. Now I word it this way because a lot of people think this way. Insulation versus HVAC. That's not at all how we need to be thinking about it. It's really one cohesive system. It needs to work together. Like we just said, build it tight, ventilate right. Now, if our HVAC is centered around and built and designed around our insulation and our air seal, not just our insulation, our doors, our windows, foundation, attic, everything. If your HVAC is designed and built around that, it would be so much smaller than you would probably think because you don't need nearly as much. And when I say as much, I mean you don't need as much output. You don't need as many BTUs because it's contained. Now you might need fresh air. You might need a fresh air line on that furnace because yes, that house is tight. It's not breathing, but that fresh air hooked up to your HVAC. That's where you get those those air changes per hour. If you build a house super tight, you insulate it with foam, super tight now. If you need that fresh air, put an inlet on your HVAC. It's not expensive. It's not complicated. Every HVAC contractor knows this. If your house needs more exhaust, meaning if you're building up too much humidity, if your house is getting muggy, if you're getting condensation, that sort of thing. Exhaust, there's a lot of different ways to fix this. Bathroom fans is a really simple way. Um, when, uh, when we do a lot of houses, something really simple is just that. Introduce or use a bathroom fan a couple times a day and this will solve that problem. R value versus thermal resistance. Now this is titled properly because it's two different things. So this chart here actually shows conductive heat flow. Now in the model it uses open cell spray foam essentially is the same thing for injection foam. This company um, happened to use open cell for the model but again essentially the same thing for injection spray foam. Uh, Energy Modeling Agency is actually a company that does REM designs and if any of you get into new construction that is a program that shows foam insulation although it has a lower R value meets and exceeds code because it's overall efficiency. Why? REM design takes into account air seal. REM design is it's simply a computer program. What this shows is that foam insulation does stop conductive heat flow. After that, airflow. We talked about convection. Obviously something we need to stop, right? Want to give everyone some evidence real quick, some tips and some different things, some examples as we've talked about. As some of you may know, if you follow the Foam University channel, which if you don't, you should, it's awesome. But in this picture, you see a cooler. But as you can see here, this is that new style of cooler. Super thick walls, super thick, thick bottom and top. Can anyone tell me? What is all around that cooler? What's surrounding the inside? Plastic, yes, but I heard foam, closed cell foam. Yeah, it's foam insulation. It's all it is. Yeti is one of the most genius marketing companies ever. All they did is take a cooler and make super thick walls. That's it. Now I will say a lot of coolers, the bottom end or the top typically didn't have any, your, your grandpa's old Coleman um, probably didn't have anything in the top. The attic, you might say, that was usually bare and the bottom usually had a thin layer. But all they did is really, they made all the, the outside thick and they added these gaskets. As you can see, I circled these gaskets at the opening. Who, what do you guys think those gaskets do? Shout it out. Air seal. Air seal. We're getting it, right? 
That's all it is. And you see this, and it will hold its temperature seven days, right? And keep uh, ice for seven days is what they tell. In Texas, maybe six days. Now, this is essentially a house. I understand it doesn't have an HVAC system. That's why I said essentially. But you have a bottom, cross base, basement, foundation, walls. That's what we do. Top. Obviously, that's sealed up. And again, those gaskets for air seal because that is super, super important. Starbucks, Tim Hortons, they use uh, basically like a cardboard cup, right? Some sort of paper cup. Now, what do they often do? They put that backup sleeve on that cup, right? So now you got, you got your paper cup, but that paper cup can't contain that heat. It won't protect you from the conduction from that hot, expensive, beautiful Seattle brewed coffee. So they put that backup sleeve on it. And now it's bearable. Right? And even then, sometimes you can feel that heat. right? And then you still try to drink it. You do that weird breathing thing in the car. <coughs> but they need that backup. But for those of us who are on a tighter budget and you go to the, uh, the mobile on the corner and you get the, that white basic plastic styrofoam cup and you pour your coffee in it, you hit the road. Do you ever have to put a backup sleeve on that styrofoam cup? No. Why? Because there's not a, sh a chart showing you how paper and fibrous products stop heat flow because they don't that well. They did many moon ago. Now, don't get me wrong, there are applications for fiberglass and cellulose, absolutely. But foam simply works better. And again, that's why that cheap kind of mud tasting, not from Seattle coffee you get from the mobile on the corner, you get that small victory that you didn't have to have that wussy sleeve just to drink your coffee in the morning. <laughs> Essentially, when we talk about um, like vapor drive or moisture movement in the house, right? Um, a lot of people are concerned about like putting a vapor barrier on the inside of the house because uh, you don't want to get water inside the, the cavity, so you got to put a vapor barrier on the inside. And when we talk about vapor drive in general, diffusion is just if you had a wall that was sealed off with drywall separating, like two sides. If moisture just had to diffuse, meaning like penetrate, infiltrate, and work its way all the way through that sheet of drywall and get to the other side, over a heating season, only a third of a quart of moisture vapor would actually diffuse its way through that drywall without any type of opening. Uh, the point to that is that diffusion is a very slow moving process. Whereas if there's an inch by inch square out, uh, cut out of it, air will carry vapor rapidly. That's really the point, that moisture and vapor will travel very, very quickly through air. So if you have those gaps and cracks in your building envelope on the outside of your wall, moisture can get into and out of your house uncontrollably through openings. That's really the point to it. So like if you're looking for, um, if you're worried about moisture inside or out of the house, if you have gaps and cracks, you have no way to control it is the point. That even a one inch square will let 30 quarts of water through, just in vapor. That's not a leak. That's not like if you have a pipe leak or raining or anything, vapor. Everyday living, you know, boiling, cooking, showering, that sort of thing, 30 quarts. It's like 31.9, it's an odd statistic. 30 quarts um, will get through that one inch square. My walls need to breathe or my house needs to breathe. Okay, let's say that concept is accurate. Do you think the uncalculated, unmeasured penetrations in your exterior, in your building envelope is adequate for your house? How do you even know? It's not measured. You don't know how much airflow is going in. You don't know if it's going in or out. How can you say if the house needs to breathe, how much? And is uh, are all those penetrations giving it what it actually needs? There are a couple ways to attack an attic and simply put, you can put insulation on the floor of your attic, more of a traditional style, whether that's foam or a blown in material. And if you do that, 
you do need vents, whether it's soffit and ridge vents or gable vents, they can be mechanical or free air vents. Uh, if you do that, yes. Why? Because you are now putting a barrier on the lid of the heating space, the conditioned space of the house, and that attic space, that lumber that we are, we, you know, your attic's built out of, you do need air movement up there so that it does not become stagnant, so that it does not get trapped. Um, I believe a better method is an unventilated attic system where spray foam is put on the, the roof deck and the gables and it's unvented because now your attic is semi-conditioned and you're relying on your HVAC system to get that circulation throughout that area. So two, two separate systems really. You can do a ventilated attic where again, insulation on the floor and yes, you absolutely need vents and you need to make sure they're maintained and clear. But if you go to a roof deck system or a hot roof, as people like to call it, that would be a ventless system and you rely on your HVAC just like you would your basement, your bathroom, any other area in the house. Radiant barriers, barriers uh, you got to remember again, radiation works in waves, right? As we talked about. So radiant barriers need to be placed somewhere where they can bounce heat back toward or away from wherever you want that heat to be right so if you're in a climate where it makes sense to retain heat a radiant barrier could be put on the lid of your conditioned space to make sure that heat stays inside the building envelope now again if you're putting a radiant barrier above attic insulation that's on your floor you can disperse heat that might be coming up through the attic that's like outside heat so like sun and that sort of thing it's actually radiating onto the roof of your house you can do that the trick with that is you really have to make sure your ventilation is up kept because now if you're bouncing heat around if you're creating similar to that mushroom cloud if you're bouncing heat back up if it's not getting out where it needs to be you can really trap moisture and you can cause some problems so it can work in that way but radiant barriers i've found are often misused uh, so if you're going to use it above facing up, then um, again, you need to make sure your ventilation is super, uh, super proper. If you have a radiant barrier on the top of your insulation facing down, meaning the radiant uh, layer is facing into your attic insulation, well, it's, it's not really designed to work that way because it's not meant to bounce back conductive heat nearly as effectively. So it's really, you need some space barrier. So if you think about like, uh, you're familiar with the, the emergency space blankets, you know, the, the aluminum foil looking things and they say an emergency, you got to uh, put that around yourself. Now, the thing about that is uh, the best way to use that. And I've spent a lot of time in the woods. The best way to use those is to actually take off your clothes and put that around yourself and let that heat, let your body heat bounce out of your body hit that reflective layer and go back towards yourself. You need somewhat of a gap and barrier. Your clothes is an in, are insulation. That's why, again, if you put that barrier on top of insulation, it's not gonna work as effectively because that house heat coming up has to get through the insulation, hit that barrier, then bounce back through the insulation to get back into the house. A cathedral ceiling, basically you have a limited area that's tricky to get insulation into. Fair point, I get it. Now, because you have that cathedral ceiling, does that mean that your homeowner has to suffer through nothing in the walls? In my opinion, absolutely not. Are there options for the cathedral ceiling? Yes. Is it a more invasive process? Yes. Just because the answer is complicated, or invasive does not make it the wrong answer. Yes, you need something in the top, you need something in the walls. Unfortunately, your situation is gonna be a little bit more complicated, but it doesn't change the science. Well, I hope you enjoyed all of that science. If you did learn a few things and you want to learn some more, you should subscribe to this channel because we give you all kinds of building science tidbits, things about home insulation, all things that you as a homeowner need to know. Don't forget if you want to learn more, also check out our website, retrofoam.com. This is the Professor of Foam reminding you that building is a science.